So before we can start really recreating the topology for a head so that we can attach it back to the body, we're going to need to talk a little bit about what topology is and what edge flow means so that we can understand what we're actually doing and why. So to give you a little bit of background on this term, uh, topology is considered the study of surfaces, uh, topos meaning like the top of something or surface, and ology of course being the study of, and the actual origin of what we use comes from uh, this example. This was a, a, a town in Austria, Königsberg, and they had seven bridges aligned throughout this town. They had a couple canals going around the central part of the town, and people on Sundays would walk around and try to see, could they end up back where they started, crossing each bridge only once? Well, this was an interesting problem and a fun game for people to do, but it eventually turned into something of a logic puzzle. You see, uh, there was a competition that went out to mathematicians saying, can anyone determine for X number of bridges, can you go over each of them and what's the most optimal path? Uh, again, seems pretty silly, but somebody named Euler, who you might have heard of before, invented fluid dynamics, came up with a solution. Euler's solution wasn't to think about bridges like everyone else was. Instead, he broke it down not into the bridges, but the connections between those bridges, taking these large land masses, the things people tended to think of, and instead turning them into nodes, and thinking of the bridges as lines that connect those nodes. Ultimately, he determined that you couldn't cross the seven bridges of Königsberg without going over one of them twice. He had the mathematical proof for it, but he also had an equation that proved how to create the most optimal connection between a series of points. And if this sort of thing on the right looks a little familiar to you, it's because the math that we use in computer graphics to create these triangles on the screen that turn into meshes comes from this exact equation, comes from the work Euler did. And that's why I want you to understand it's about creating the smoothest, most optimal connection between points, because that's what the computer's gonna calculate the best and be the most efficient and work the best for everything we're gonna work on. So to bring it back into computers, we have these three things, a triangle, a quad, and an n-gon. You've probably heard me use some of these quad, like, terms before, but this is what they essentially mean. A tri is a triangle. We just say tri because we say it a lot. And these are any three-sided face. So three verts connect together by three edges, make a tri. The quad is four-sided objects. And this can be any kind of twisted or configuration. It doesn't have to exactly be a square, although we like to keep them as square as possible because as I'm gonna mention in a second, they divide very evenly and very cleanly. And then we have the n-gon, which is anything of n number of sides that is more than four. That's why we call it an n-gon, because it could be a six-sided polygon or a seven-sided polygon, like a septagon, an octagon, a tetrahedron. We want these, well, that's a three-dimensional shape, but we want this to be, this is any n number of shapes. And these are colored because a quad is the ideal. We want quads, we want squares. Triangles are okay, and we use them, and definitely triangles are gonna come into place, but we only use triangles when we have to. And then we get to n-gons, which is always, always to be avoided wherever we can in our modeling because it can lead to some really big issues. Now, of course, n-gons have their uses, and we'll talk about that when I get a little bit into modeling. But the thing to note is, you, if it comes down to it, you might have heard, well, all things are gonna get triangulated anyway, because truthfully, what we think of as a quad is actually two triangles squeezed together. And it's true. Everything that gets rendered on the screen has to get turned into all triangles. The reason we like quads is because they have an even number of sides. Again, we'll talk about it in a second, but they always turn into two triangles. The problem with an n-gon is what configuration of triangles can it connect together? In fact, the thing that's nice about quads is they divide cleanly. A triangle can't do this and an n-gon can't do this. I can draw a line straight through any four-sided object and get two two-sided objects. And this means that we can subdivide, we can move cleanly. This is how we smooth out models. This is why sculpting works better with quad models. This is why deformation or moving your character works better with quad models because it subdivides and moves predictably. The computer understands how to process it because like grid paper, it's much easier to work on. Think about yourself in math class, you didn't learn on triangular or hexagonal grid paper, you learned on square grids because squares are easier to process. It's got two dimensions that work together. They also are great because they fold predictably. A triangle doesn't fold at all, 
but a good quad will either fold in this direction or that direction, and that's it. It can never fold in on itself by accident. Uh, however, of course, if you look at an engram, the horrible pentagram of death, it could fold in any number of ways and it can create something really, really awful. So when you think about the engram, think about some sort of horrific satanic pentagram of doom because that's what it does for your models. See, engons, when they show up on models, they can create these stretching or bat wing effects. They can create weird pinching or areas of smoothing that work right. Maybe you've tried to do your loop cut tool or an extruder, an inset, and you go, it doesn't do what I want it to do. It doesn't do what I expect it to do. And because lo and behold, somewhere in there, there's an engon that's messing up your day. This is why we try our best to eliminate them and get rid of them as quickly as possible. And once I teach you about some of the stuff in this class today, you won't be able to help seeing engons and trying to figure out in your own head how to turn them into quads. I do it all the time when I walk around and I look at things. So with that understanding about like what that topology is, edge flow is the application of those principles to create good topology. Look at this example. This is uh, from Hippie Drum, and we can see this back, but not only does it have squares that are all quads, as you notice, there's a real flow to the direction of these shapes. This might look a little similar to the topology on the body we made, and that's for a reason. We really want to make sure that it, it flows with the direction of shapes and objects, and it almost follows the musculature. But you can really see the places in which it redirects into these different directions to help evenly distribute, but also create topology that flows well. You see these two heads, um, and this is actually taken from a really old, very great discussion on loops and poles that's been since archived way back in the early 2000s on some obscure blender form. But these two heads have a similar number of points and verts, but one looks more defined and more finished and the other one looks rougher and worse because this one has better distribution of points that do a better job of highlighting what we're looking at. Another reason that these engon that we want to get in quads and not in triangles is quads are much, much easier to unwrap. As you can see here, it's all triangles, but it's broken into quads. And when we're doing our UV unwrapping, having quads, loops that go all the way through is going to save us a ton of time and it's going to make texturing way easier. Another reason we like quads is they deform really well. So this is another hippie drum example. And you can see because these are evenly distributed quads, we can bend them and deform them. In fact, anywhere you want something to deform, you almost always want a loop around. And we're going to talk about exactly what a loop means. When we're talking about face topology, though, it's really all about the loops. Look at this face. These these directions of these lines aren't random and they weren't made capriciously. Every single one of these directions of lines, every single rotation, you can see it's sort of fitting around the mouth and these loops are going around the eyes and these loops are running up down the center of the face. This isn't by accident. This isn't because it's the only way to model a face. This is because this is the kind of modeling that produces the best deformation. Think about it, if I have to open and close my mouth, I need a loop around it. It needs to be able to stretch out like a rubber band, same with my eyes. And in fact, there's other loops that run the whole way around the outside of the eyes, almost like a domino mask, so I can lift and raise my brows and move my cheeks. The way we do this um, is we think about it a lot in terms of loops. So a loop is, as I'm going to discuss, any grouping that kind of flows in one direction. Uh, and I'll talk about, again, definition of loops specifically, but we think in terms of key areas. And so when we're actually going to do our own topology for these faces, uh, we're going to start with things like the eye and the mouth and the nose and the ear loops and then connect everything in between because those are our most key areas. This is a good example of some good situational topology for a face. And in fact, faces as, a, as an exercise of topology are considered more or less quote unquote solved because we know how to approach them. These different colored areas show different loops grouping in. You can see when I say loop, there's sort of a flow to the direction of them. So we got a loop all the way up over the nose and under the mouth, which helps me be able to stretch out the whole face. We have loops around the face and the mouth itself, which lets me open and close it. Loops around the nose, which help you kind of wrinkle it and pull it up. Loops around the eyes, which will let you open and close them. And a loop around this whole area, which helps you define the brow and the cheeks. So this is where we get to these terms that I've been using a little bit already, loops and then poles. Um, and I'll talk about what those all are. So what is a loop? A loop is can be made up of faces and a loop can be made up of edges. 
But the way to understand it is a loop is any grouping or selection, let's say of just faces for now, that always passes through two other faces or a uh, line or an edge that always passes through two other edges. So let's kind of go over here and look at this little line running along. This is all one connected edge loop because each time this edge goes and it gets to a point, it's subdividing exactly two other, it's crossing through exactly two other verts. It goes up, two other verts. It goes up, two other verts. What if we went out here and we turned? Well, we would be moving up and we'd be crossing across this vert, this vert, and this vert. And we'd be ignoring this vert back here. So we aren't actually in a loop now because we're not dividing an even number. The same thing happens with these faces. Each of these little faces in a loop is crossing exactly as it goes up one, two, this one goes up, one, two, it goes up to here, one, two, from here, one, two, from here, one, two, it's always crossing exactly two at any given time. Even when it seems to turn a corner, see this little face right here, it's crossing that face and that face. But then if we come here, this face is crossing that face and that face. If we come here, this face crosses that face and that face. So it understands the computer knows that the flow of the edges goes this way. Now, this is not one because we can see it turns and it makes a corner and now it's going from here to here and it's by going down, it's crossing this face, this face and this face here. It's too many. So it's no longer a loop. We need these loops because of course they help us deform, but they also help us define. The left side isn't anatomically incorrect and everything's in quads. But without these loops and without poles to help control the direction of these loops, it doesn't create something as nice looking of a face, even though this has a lot more geometry and way more verts than this one over here. This brings us to the other partner of the loop, which is the pole. A pole is a term we get from mathematics in terms of the calculation of a sphere, which is where they think about lots of points converging together. And we use this as a term for areas in which we redirect that edge flow, where we take a loop and we move it in a new direction instead of it just going straight like it wants to on a grid. So one of the most important types of poles, I'm going to talk about two in specifically, are the N pole and the E pole. So the end pole is any pole that's connected to three other verts. You see most of the time, especially on a grid, each vert is connected to one, two, three, four verts. But an end pole is only connected to one, two, three verts. This has a pulling effect. You can think about the end pole as like it yanks something in. It tends to pull the curve in towards it almost like gravity. And we call it an end pole because the letter N is made up of three sides. So one, two, three. Sometimes people call it a three vert pole or something like that. The end pole is a convention that come from, came from Blender users years ago from this forum post I was talking about because they think about it as one, two, three points. Now the E pole is the opposite. It actually has a pushing effect and each E pole is connected to one, two, three, four, five points instead of three. And there's a kind of a conservation here between an E and an N pole. For every E pole, there's usually an N pole because an N is connected to three, an E is connected to five, and together they make four, just as if two separate regular verts connected together would be each connected to four. We call this an E because it looks like four lines, one, two, three, four, but of course, as you understand from topology, to make this little five out here, that means we need a vert right there, which means there's actually one, two, three, four, five lines. And this is a, a really important point, and one of the reasons I like the naming of it is because it understands that this and this are two separate edges, and it's a really important understanding of the geometry here. Just because it's straight, if there's a vert between them, remember an edge isn't a straight line, it's an edge is um, the number of, it's like any connection between two verts. So we were really concerned with this because we can run into something like this guy here, uh, a high valiance point, which can create this weird big pinching when really we want this kind of shape. And this comes from having a bunch of tries going into a single pole. We call this a high valiance vert, and this means that this is a pole that's connected to who knows how many. In a general rule, especially when you're doing something like characters, most of the time you're gonna use N and E poles occasionally it's okay to have a point that's connected to six verts, but we almost never want more than that if we can possibly avoid it. And there's almost always a better way to do it. It's often, often much better to try to find other ways of more quad-based connecting things up. 
And there's lots of ways. Uh, there's a lot of diagrams like this on the internet where you can take any number of openings and connect them any number of times. But I just wanted to show you like this is like a little diagram showing some creative ways of creating our topology or quad based topology even out of uh, a lot of different numbers of connecting points. So these edge loops is an example where this little white ring is not an edge loop. From here to here is a loop because each time, as I mentioned, it connects through just two other verts. But here it's turning a corner because here we have an N pole and here we have an E pole. However, everything in here, if I select it, will go all the way around. This is also why sometimes when you alter option click on something, you'll see this one selects a whole loop, but this one stops because the loop it's selecting is this contiguous system. That's how the program Blender knows which one to connect. These examples, not an edge loop, because again, as you can see, it's kind of turning a corner here. We also want to avoid what's called a spiral. Uh, a spiral is any time a loop runs its way around and down, we want our loops to connect in back on themselves. This is a feature sometimes of like auto retopology tools create a lot of spirals, and uh, early topology often had these, and spirals are really bad because it also is hard for the computer to work with, and it's really tough to unwrap. Um, Any time that our loop ends, uh, we call it a terminator. This can be a triangle or n-gon, so it, it can't find a way of dividing two edges. This can be any one of the poles that'll come and our selection will stop there, or just a hole. So if we draw a line through, it'll stop because it can't keep going. There's more no more geometry to go for. We also have sometimes called C loops. These are loops between two holes, often used for things like brows. Um, and a face loop, again, this is just a face loop made of C loops, not a face loop. So a couple key things that we want to avoid, and then I'm going to show you uh, some in Blender examples. One thing you might see a lot of warning about is called non-manifold geometry. What non-manifold means is it's not mathematically logical. It doesn't make sense in the way it's formed. So this shape can't make any sense because there's no flow to it. These are two faces and then just one face shoots off from both of them. There's no direction to it. Which way is forward? Which way is up? It doesn't make sense. At the same time, two or more faces that share a single vertex but don't have any edges shared between them, the computer doesn't understand where the flow of geometry should go here because it's just one point but they don't share any edges. And then any faces that have normals that are in opposite directions. Often when you're extruding or you're insetting, uh, the computer gets really confused about what direction it's supposed to do the inset because the two faces are facing opposite direction. Another thing to worry about is what are called non-planar faces. For instance, this quad, is it this shape or this shape? Uh, sometimes the computers know how to triangulate it because is it supposed to be like this or is it supposed to be like this? Uh, is it a hill or is it a valley? It doesn't know because you've taken a four-sided object and bent it. And then we also want to look out for, as I mentioned, those high valence verts, verts that are connected to lots and lots of points, which can create a lot of awkward ballooning and shapes and loose vertices. So sometimes it looks like a quad, but there's an extra vert there, and that can cause a lot of trouble. So that's a, an introduction to the world of the terms, the things I want you to understand. In the next video, I'm gonna take you through kind of like what this is and show you how we can set up retopology so that we can connect up our very complicated head to a much, much, make a much, much simpler one.